to present on low resource metadata uh, data repositories. He comes from School of IT, University of Cape Town um, in South Africa. Um, please go ahead, Hussein. Um, thank you. Um, are you getting my slides? Yes. Thanks. Yeah, being yeah. Firstly, thank you to the organizers for the invitation to um, attend and to present at this event. Uh, I'm going to talk about something that, well, I would classify as something completely different. I had a colleague who came to me about sometime at the beginning of last year with a whole lot of metadata and essentially wanted to have all of this metadata made available online. And it turns out that all the solutions she was looking at up until that point in time were not quite working for her. And this sent me down a bit of a, a rabbit hole where I think I, I'm, I'm still thinking about this. And this has led to this idea of low resource repositories that I'm going to talk about today. So what is a low resource repository or a low resource archive? I was at a conference in India about 15 years ago where uh, we were all talking about the best way to build repositories and to deal with especially heritage collections. And in this discussion, I had a colleague who stood up and said, well, give me 2 million euros, clearly this person was from Europe, and two years, and I can build any repository system that you might need. And with that statement, I think immediately, the entire room knew that this was not the solution, that most people simply did not have 2 million euros, did not have two years in some cases, and most certainly didn't have the people who were going to build all of these solutions. So we wanted to know, are there other answers to this question? Can we use standardized software systems like DSpace was still uh, relatively new at the time. I don't think Atom was around yet. Can people who don't have the resources do the same things as everybody else in the world? Uh, a, a more devious question maybe, can we do better? Should we do better? Or do we have to do better than everybody else? And these are the questions that, that I wonder about a lot when uh, thinking about how to build these repositories. So a low resource environment is another thing I've, I've been corrected on in the past. A lot of time we assume it is the poor countries. Uh, clearly there are resources poor countries like many African countries do not have. Um, but there are also specific areas. And I remember once doing um, a presentation on uh, bandwidth sensitive applications. And I had a colleague from Scotland who pointed out that in rural Scotland, people had the exact same bandwidth issues as we have in rural South Africa. So it turns out that the rural areas in many parts of the world actually have lots of things in common and they would, could be classified as low resource environments in some way as well. And then of course we have specific organizations. So you could be an organization in New York City, but if you don't have the funding, you are not going to get some kind of archiving or repository project off the ground. Um, and you may have just as many problems as somebody anywhere else. So this is a fairly all pervasive problem. But I want to talk about African problems because this is what I understand the best. So there are three things that I think uh, stand out the most when I think about how we're going, we are going to go about solving problems related to digital repositories. The first is skills and education. Our archivists, our people who are trained in archiving, in libraries, in museums, are simply not as highly skilled as people elsewhere. And sadly, education in digital media is not the norm as it might be elsewhere. And and besides this, if you are uh, going to use the general population in any way as part of what you might call end user data curation, this turns out to be very difficult. We've done some fairly interesting studies over the years where we use crowdsourcing and volunteer computing and tried to assess the effectiveness of this. And we found in many cases that these things don't work in low resource environments and in particular environments in the same way that they work uh, in other parts of the world. So in fact, we get different results from what all the research says. The second problem is funding. Well, there's no funding, right? Um, if you're working on an archiving or a preservation project uh, in South Africa, which is a middle income country, not even classified as a poor country these days, almost all 
such projects, all these so-called digitization projects are funded by external donors. And there's very little money and we need to do more with what we have. The third problem is this thing called the digital divide. Now, I'm one of the luckiest people. I have a very good internet connection where I am sitting at home. Um, but I have to recognize that the internet is non-existent in some places. And in many places, in most places, it, it doesn't work very well. So when my university shut down because of COVID-19, we had to figure out how to get all of our students connected. And it turns out many of them could not really get connected. So unlike many parts of the world, we have not been able to have video lectures. And uh, in some cases, I, I think the number that I heard was 2,000. 2,000 students had to have material on flash drives and printed material posted to them through the mail. And once again, we are the middle income country. I believe in Kenya, they simply shut down the university system for the year. Um, and you know, my colleagues can confirm this, but you know, th th things are quite bad. So if we think of high bandwidth solutions, it simply is not suitable and we need to reconceptualize how we're going to deal with these projects. So what's the net effect? There are lots of things that go wrong because of these problems. And I have some examples. So the first example is, it was a collection called, or is a collection called the South African Freedom Struggle Collection. This was a large collection of magazines, newspapers that represented the organizations during the liberation uh, struggle in South Africa. It was digitized by a group at one of our universities and they had a not very fancy interface online where you could access this, but you could find it fairly easily. If you look for this today, it does not exist. There is a copy in JSTOR, but there is no copy of this collection as important as it is in South Africa because the, we no longer have people who are skilled and we no longer have funding to maintain this locally. So this is quite a shame. The second example is the South African, or what, what used to be called the South African Rock Art Digital Archive, but is now the African Rock Art Digital Archive. This is a, a metadata collection of the most important rock art collections that are distributed all along the, uh, all within the entire region. And um, I know about this because the project still exists but last year, the person who runs the project came to me and said, essentially, we've run out of funding. We need another solution. The software we license costs a half million dollars or rounds, I think, it, uh, every year, and they don't have the money. So basically, they will last one more year. And if within that one year, they need another solution. The third problem that's caused by low resource environments is what, I'm, what I've decided this week to coin the digital subdivide. Um, where even within a, a country like South Africa, we now have those people with more resources and those with less, or those with and those without. So my institution has um, decided that they will invest a lot of money in digitization and buy in all of the support from companies that are outside the country as needed. The other two universities in the city do not have the resources to do this. So essentially they will have nothing and this creates what I'm going to call the digital subdivide. Another um, interesting story for my own institution is that um, we don't have skills. So what's the impact of not having skills? Well, every serious archive that you want to run, you have to throw a lot of money at, and you have to hire somebody like Artifactual or Admire to run your repository for you. So um, I think my, one of these, uh, Atmaya runs our institutional repository, for example, which sounds absolutely horrendous. You, know, you shouldn't have to get a, a Belgian company to, or whatever they are based to run an institutional, institutional repository in South Africa. And the fifth effect is you get nothing. So essentially, nothing's going to happen. And this is the problem with lots of people who have collections. So we don't want all of this. We need archiving. We need preservation. We don't want the drama of funding ending staff shortages, access issues. We don't want collections disappearing or never starting. And to, so, to, so to address this, the question is, how do, how do we stop this trend? Because this is clearly a trend that has been um, in existence for some time. Custom solutions are not really working. Open source software is not really working. And the question is, why? How are these tools being designed? And are they not actually matching the environment that we are in? And this is the question that drives a lot of my research. Can we create a potentially more suitable architecture for a low resource environment? 
So I think a starting point, uh, as a starting point, the Bleak and Lloyd collection, this is a, a collection of historical documents from the original inhabitants of the area that I live in, where Cape Town is based. And it's one of the most important collections in the country. And when I built this, even though I was uh, a researcher in digital libraries, I basically ignored everything I knew and I listened to what the needs of the project were and did things fairly differently. And the collection still exists today in its original form and everybody is very happy with the fact that this has persisted and no other project from its era has persisted. So when thinking about our current projects, I've reflected on, on what the principles were that, underlie, that, that were underlying the Bleak and Light collection and tried to expand on these and think about these as design goals and also try to align these with other systems out there, things like Greenstone, other very long running projects. And it turns out that there's a lot in common. So some of these things, I'll just highlight a few here, simplicity. It's amazing how much you can do with the simplest of systems. And in many instances, the complexity that you think you need is not what you really need. Uh, the notion that your system should work with or without the internet is something that lots of people don't really think too much about. Um, the idea that preservation should really be as simple as you can human as you can make it humanly possible. And the reason why I say this is because I'm thinking that this is not about preservation as much as rescue. What happens when things go horribly wrong? We want to be able to go in there and rescue all of the data and get something back to some, some kind of decent state where this can be used. So with all of these in mind, I've actually operationalized lots of these ideas and tested them. And there's a whole lot of research papers. If you go to my website, you'll find them. We have asked that maybe we are building these things wrong. Maybe there's a different approach to build these. So the first thing is, why, why do we use these relational databases? Um, how much can we get if we built our entire system out of flat files with XML metadata records in hierarchical directories. And I've been amazed that in fact, uh, we, we've been able to build a lot of systems for various different projects on this basic idea of putting metadata into, in, in XML and having the XML in files and not having a, a separate database. The second idea is, can we statically generate everything? Unlike a content management system, do we really need the software? Can we throw the software away completely? Will that work? and simply have a pre-generated site as far as possible. And the third idea is, I think it's shown on the next slide a little better. Um, in a typical system, we have a service component, a piece of software that runs on the server. Every time somebody has some kind of request that needs to be fulfilled, can we move this computation to the client side so that the server, if we have a server, doesn't actually do any computation, in which case you could even move the data to the client side and you have no need for a server at all. And this turns out to work far better than uh, you would expect as well. So I've been working on this for, for the last year and a half now where I've been developing a prototype for something called the 500 year archive, which is looking at pre-colonial uh, items that are inspired by pre-colonial history. And this looks like a typical repository. I won't say too much about it. This is essentially a metadata page. And it is a, there's an XML record, which I tend not to show in presentations that has been translated into a, 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 some kind of visual representation. And then there's a search interface, a faceted search that's built on top of the metadata records. So this entire experience, which is, which is leading up to an open source tool that's probably going to be released soon. I'm going to hold myself to soon. But I want to end by saying, there's some reflections in this process. The first reflection is one size doesn't fit all. You can't have the same solution for all of your projects. We are not online or online all the time. And I think we need to acknowledge this. I had a colleague once who was trying to distribute legal information to judges in some part of East Africa. And the entire system had to work offline because the judges did not have internet access when they were in court. And nobody was really thinking about this in designing systems. We should also note that there are compromises. You don't get simple systems for free. You can maybe create the archive more simply, but scalability may be an issue. And I've put a lot of effort into asking the question, how scalable can we become if you don't have the classical technology? It turns out you can become quite scalable. 
uh, we've done tests with up to, I think, about a million items in a collection. And what I've discovered is most people don't even have a million items in their collection. So most people don't need the really scalable solutions. And finally, I think that if we all think about resource limits and we think about these low resource environments, then maybe we will realize that these are suggesting that we need radically different approaches. And if we do take radically different approaches, maybe we'll come up with solutions that benefits the whole world. Thank you.